These facts Miss Mary was not slow to take a feminine advantage of in her present humor. But it was somewhat confusing to observe also that the beast, despite some faint signs of past dissipation, was amiable-looking. In fact, a kind of blonde Samson, whose corn-colored silken beard apparently had never yet known the touch of Barber's razor or Delilah's shears, so that the cutting speech which quivered on her ready tongue died upon her lips, and she contented herself with receiving his stammering apology with supercilious eyelids and the gathered skirts of uncontamination. When she re-entered the schoolroom, her eyes fell upon the azaleas with a new sense of revelation, and then she laughed, and the little people all laughed, and they were all unconsciously very happy. It was a hot day, and not long after this, that two short-legged boys came to grief on the threshold of the school with a pail of water, which they had laboriously brought from the spring, and that Miss Mary compassionately seized the pail and started for the spring herself. At the foot of the hill a shadow crossed her path, and a blue-shirted arm dexterously but gently relieved her of her burden. Miss Mary was both embarrassed and angry. "'If you carried more of that for yourself,' she said spitefully to the blue arm, without deigning to raise her lashes to its owner, "'you'd do better.' In the submissive silence that followed, she regretted the speech, and thanked him so sweetly at the door that he stumbled, which caused the children to laugh again, a laugh in which Miss Mary joined, until the color came faintly into her pale cheek. The next day a barrel was mysteriously placed beside the door, and as mysteriously filled with fresh spring water every morning. Nor was this superior young person without other quiet attentions. Profane Bill, driver of the Slum Glion stage, widely known in the newspapers for his gallantry and invariably offering the box seat to the fair sex, had accepted Miss Mary from this attention on the ground that he had a habit of cussing up on grades, and gave her half the coach to herself. Jack Hamlin, a gambler, having once silently ridden with her in the same coach, afterward threw a decanter at the head of a confederate for mentioning her name in a barroom. The overdressed mother of a pupil, whose paternity was doubtful, had often lingered near this astute Vestal's temple, never daring to enter its sacred precincts but content to worship the priestess from afar. With such unconscious intervals, the monotonous procession of blue skies, glittering sunshine, brief twilights, and starlit nights passed over Red Gulch. Miss Mary grew fond of walking in the sedate and proper woods. Perhaps she believed, with Mrs. Stidger, that the balsamic odors of the firs did her chest good for certainly her slight cough was less frequent, and her step was firmer. Perhaps she had learned the unending lesson which the patient pines are never weary of repeating to heedful or listless ears. And so, one day, she planned a picnic on Buckeye Hill, and took the children with her. Away from the dusty road, the straggling shanties, the yellow ditches, the clamor of restless engines, the cheap finery of shop windows, the deeper glitter of paint and colored glass, and the thin veneering which barbarism takes upon itself in such localities, what infinite relief was theirs. The last heap of ragged rock and clay passed, the last unsightly chasm crossed, how the waiting woods opened their long files to receive them. How the children, perhaps because they had not yet grown quite away from the breast of the bounteous mother, threw themselves face downward on her brown bosom with uncouth caresses, filling the air with their laughter, and how Miss Mary herself, felinely fastidious and entrenched as she was in the purity of spotless skirts, collars, and cuffs, forgot all, and ran like a crested quail at the head of her brood, until romping, laughing, and panting, with a loosened braid of brown hair, a hat hanging by a knotted ribbon from her throat, she came suddenly and violently in the heart of the forest upon the luckless Sandy. The explanations, apologies, and not overwise conversation that ensued need not be indicated here. 
It would seem, however, that Miss Mary had already established some acquaintance with this ex-drunkard, enough that he was soon accepted as one of the party. That the children, with that quick intelligence which Providence gives the helpless, recognized a friend, and played with his blond beard and long silken mustache, and took other liberties, as the helpless are apt to do. And when he had built a fire against a tree, and had shown them other mysteries of woodcraft, their admiration knew no bounds. At the close of two such foolish, idle, happy hours, he found himself lying at the feet of the schoolmistress, gazing dreamily in her face as she sat upon the sloping hillside, weaving wreaths of laurel and shringa, in very much the same attitude as he had lain when first they met. Nor was the similitude greatly forced, the weakness of an easy, sensuous nature that had found a dreamy exaltation in liquor. It is to be feared was now finding an equal intoxication in love. I think that Sandy was dimly conscious of this himself. I know that he longed to be doing something, slaying a grizzly, scalping a savage, or sacrificing himself in some way for the sake of this sallow-faced, gray-eyed schoolmistress. As I should like to present him, in an heroic attitude, I stay my hand with great difficulty at this moment, being only withheld from introducing such an episode by a strong conviction that it does not usually occur at such times, and I trust that my fairest reader, who remembers that, in a real crisis, it is always some uninteresting stranger or unromantic policeman, and not Adolphus, who rescues, will forgive the omission. So they sat there, undisturbed, the woodpeckers chattering overhead, and the voices of the children coming pleasantly from the hollow below. What they said matters little. What they thought, which might have been interesting, did not transpire. The woodpeckers only learned how Miss Mary was an orphan, how she left her uncle's house to come to California for the sake of health and independence, how Sandy was an orphan too, how he came to California for excitement, how he had lived a wild life, and how he was trying to reform, and other details which, from a woodpecker's viewpoint, undoubtedly must have seemed stupid and a waste of time. But even in such trifles was the afternoon spent, and when the children were again gathered, and Sandy, with a delicacy which the schoolmistress well understood, took leave of them quietly at the outskirts of the settlement, it had seemed the shortest day of her weary life.' 